Hello, you're listening to The Debrief, and I'm Angus Scott. It's a three-horse title race. We haven't said that much before. Is this one genuine, or are we going to get excited for a bit and then Man City end up winning four on the spin? Well, not if Jurgen Klopp has his farewell way, nor if Arsenal can get over their serial underachievers tag and finally pass the finish line for the first time in 20 years. That's when Facebook was launched, although it was originally called The Facebook. I didn't know that. Our usual contribution from transfer guru Fabrizio Romano to come. And we'll also be hearing from Charles Watts, the author of Revolution, The Rise of Arteta's Arsenal. He knows this club inside out. But of course, I'm really pleased to say that as ever, alongside me, is Ben Jacobs. Good afternoon or evening. A new fact known. I didn't yeah, know the did, Facebook thing either. I didn't know that at all. It's odd. And how le- losing just three little letters, the Facebook, to Facebook actually makes quite a bit of difference. If you were going to lose three letters out of out of your name, Ben, what would you, what would you, <laughs> what would you, what would you change? <laughs> ben Obbs. <laughs> mm, it's not quite got the same ring to it, has it? Angus Sko? No, Sk. No. Anyway, Uh, we'll move on. Arsenal's path to the title. That's what we're discussing today. They're one of three, top of the pile. But Ben, what have they got to do to actually get over the line and emulate Arsene Wenger's 2004 side? Well, I think it would be better than Arsenal's Invincibles, if I'm honest. I know we can look at the statistics and say one was unbeaten and the other wouldn't be, but it's so hard to win the Premier League. And if you win it in a three-horse race and you beat Manchester City and a Liverpool team in Klopp's final season, that's better for me, just because the league has got more competitive. And I think what they need to do is, first and foremost, not wobble like they did when they were front runners. And in a weird way, it might be easier for them because it's tighter and there was maybe more of a sense of expectation last season because at times they had leads, whereas now it's so tight that there's finer margins. And naturally, if they can keep everybody fit and not lose key players, then they'll be in a very strong position. But I think what worries me for Arsenal and to be fair, Liverpool as well, I don't know if you agree, is just the running is tough for them. And if you add depth in the Champions League, should they get past Bayern Munich, then not only are there no easy fixtures, but they've got a congested fixture calendar with what I would consider to be tougher games than either Liverpool or Manchester City. Liverpool have got a Merseyside derby. Liverpool have got to go away at, at a few tough places. That is for sure. But when you look at Arsenal having to have that season-defining game away at Manchester City where they've got to get something, in my opinion. And then in addition to that, home to Aston Villa isn't easy. They've got a North London derby and that's away at Spurs. They've got to go away at Manchester United. They've got to play Everton and they might be fighting for their lives and that's on the final game of the season. So I think that of the three teams, Arsenal have got the hardest running and then Manchester City have probably got the easiest running and the most depth. So I think that means in simple terms, if Arsenal are going to win the title, they've got to get something in this next game after the international break against Manchester City. Otherwise, not mathematically, of course, because it's always going to be tight. But I think practically, if they lose that game, then I don't see how they win the Premier League title. I, I think I'm with you. Uh, and, the, and the trouble is they've got such a poor record at, at Manchester City and, and have been embarrassed there recently. But what, a, what a, when you look at Manchester City's fixtures, you're thinking, well, what are their difficult ones? You, After the Arsenal one, yep, Villa at home. Arsenal have got to play Villa as well. But yes, Real Madrid will take their uh, mind off things for just a couple of minutes. But then when you're talking about Luton, Chelsea at home, Nottingham Forest... Wolves, Fulham, West Ham, they're not the sort of sides, I don't think, that are going to worry you that much. And I know everyone can beat everyone, I suppose, on their day, but not when a Manchester City team is um, refined to perform a crescendo at the right part of the season. And I feel that's exactly what they're doing and, and what Arsenal didn't do last year. 
yeah, I mean, Arsenal lost William Saliba. It was a big blow. We know that. And they didn't quite have the depth to recover. And comparative to now, they were less experienced as well. So if we're making a case for Arsenal, they're scoring goals for fun, 30 plus in 2024. And in addition to that, they are, as of now, because of the draw between Liverpool and Manchester City, top of the Premier League on goal difference. And it's reasonably healthy goal difference in the sense that you've got 10 games left. You've got plus five over Liverpool. And I think it's a nine goal difference between them and Manchester City. So if Arsenal stay free scoring, then unless Liverpool or City beat someone by six or seven, Arsenal will feel like they can keep pace. So it's in their hands, but it won't be, obviously, if they lose to Manchester City in their next game. So this is what I fear for Arsenal. But if you look at the fixtures that you spoke of for Manchester City, they've got an away game against Crystal Palace. They only drew with them at home. Teams fighting for their lives will pull results out of the bag. So we may get surprises. It, in my opinion, will come down to the final day. But I think for Arsenal, the most important thing, if they are to win the Premier League, is that they are front runners. If we get to a point between game 28, which is now, and game 32, where Manchester City are top, and clear, then I think that there'll be no looking back. So it's really important for Arsenal and Liverpool that they're front runners. Otherwise, I think if Manchester City sneak ahead, and that may happen in the next run of fixtures, at that point and at this stage of the season, I'd be very surprised if they throw it away. Don't forget, we have Fabrizio Romano on the way, our transfer guru. He'll be uh, dropping in for the latest and certainly talking about Arsenal. And very interestingly, Charles Watts, who um, is now on the uh, court offside, um, paid payroll i believe um so it's good to have uh, him on board as well and uh, he if you don't know is um certainly a an arsenal insider and uh, knows any, any everything and anything that's going on at the emirates and we'll have an interesting chat with him in a moment um and your thoughts are always welcome please do uh, get in touch with us and we'll ask uh, the guys as many questions as possible ben and um, before i go to charles though for you how much business do you expect Arsenal to be doing during the summer, irrespective of whether they win this league title, come second, or as many would predict, they actually come third? Quite a bit because they will get Champions League football. And with that, it means that you can plan and budget. I think outgoings are going to be important for everyone because of profit and sustainability. The first thing to say about Arsenal is that They've got various assets that they can either get off the wage bill or potentially get fees for. Eddie and Ketir is one that can open up the door to bring in a striker. And then Aaron Ramsdale may want game time. So Arsenal would love to keep him, but let's wait and see. I think the goalkeeper, even though he's got a very amenable personality, may start pushing because it's clear that David Rea is the number one. And then we know in midfield, Thomas Partey's had a question mark over him for quite some time. So another midfielder could come in, Douglas Luiz, Martin Zubimendi. Neither of them are easy, but Arsenal have tracked them for quite some time. And they're not integral to the Arsenal squad, but a player like Cedric leaving still frees up a squad space and a little bit of money off the wage bill. So Arsenal will be looking predominantly for a striker. And we know that they'll be in the conversation potentially for Victor Oshiman, also a player like Victor Goikarez, who some have linked with Chelsea, but there's denials from the Chelsea side. I've seen that question in the chat that there was ever any kind of offer in January. Ivan Tony might be somebody that Arsenal consider, but don't rule out free agency in 2025 rather than 2024. But Arsenal, if they've got a big bulk of money to spend, striker's going to be important. Midfield is a possibility if there are outgoings. And then obviously if Ramsdale leaves, they find themselves in a position where they probably look for some kind of backup goalkeeper. It's not Mikel Arteta's preference, but they're at a very interesting point in their juncture now because a lot of the players they back in the long term have been given long-term contracts. And as a result of that internal revamp, which is probably the best way of putting it, where over the course of 18 months, various players at the football club have been secured for the long run. If you've not got that contract or if you've not got that game time, it's now where you start to say, maybe I've got to go elsewhere. So there's a question mark over Emil Smith-Rowe as well, which I think would divide opinion amongst the Arsenal fan base. Some would like to see him given more opportunities. Others may feel that it's time for him to leave. 
And this is the key juncture because if Arsenal get four or five outgoings, then they may generate the kind of money that allows them to move a bit bigger in the market. So I think because of profit and sustainability, they spent big on Declan Rice, Urien Timber, who luckily will be coming back from injury now relatively soon. And Kai Havertz was a big outlay as well. So they have to be a little bit financially conscious. But ultimately, there are assets in the football club like Nketiah, 30, 35 million that they can sell to allow them a bit more freedom in the market. So I do expect them to be relatively busy. That's a big price for Eddie Nketiah. Mm. If if a striker is worth 30 or 30, or if that's what Arsenal value him at, then um, I, I don't know what club would pay 30 or 35 million for Eddie Nketiah, who still, uh, for me, is is unproven at, at the highest level. But But we know that Everybody needs, most people need a striker. And as you said, Arsenal are one of those. But Eddie and Kessie are clearly not fitting the bill. Right, but someone will know all about uh, this. is Charles Watts. And uh, Charles uh, is the author of the Sunday Times bestseller, Arteta, The Rise of Arteta's Arsenal. It's been fascinating to watch. It's a fascinating read. And a little bit earlier, I caught up with Charles. Charles, thanks for joining us on The Debrief. I wonder what you think, Arsenal's chances of actually winning the title are? Oh, God, I mean, it's they're, they're good. You can't be sitting top of the table with 10 games to go and and they not be good. But, you know, I think you look at the Opta, Opta have sort of crunched the numbers and they've done the win probability percentage and Arsenal are still way, way behind Manchester City and Liverpool. And I, I think when you look at Arsenal's away games between now and the end of the season, there's a big, that's the big reason for that, you know, a way to, a way to, City obviously next, but then you've got away you got away games at Old Trafford and, and and Spurs as well, and you know they're very very difficult games. And in this sort of race with Liverpool and Manchester City, you barely can afford any sort of slip up. And you know if Arsenal are going to win the title, then they're going to have to go to these big away games, and then they're going to have to get the job done and get those type of wins that teams do when they get over the line. You know, I go back to you know way back to 1998 when Arsenal travelled up to Old Trafford at sort of this stage of the season. And Marco Mar scored the winner. They won one nil, and that was the sort of launch pad for them to go on and win the league that season. And there's countless other victories in title winning years that you look away from home and, and sort of pinpoint that as a, as the moment. And you know, if Arsenal can go to Man City at the end of this international break on the 31st and go there and win something that they've not done for an awful long time, um, then they're going to have a really really good chance. But you do feel that they're probably going to have to get something out of that trip to the Etihad if they don't. Even with nine games to go, you think they're probably going to be, they're going to struggle. But as you've said, they've done it before. And and you just wonder if they could go there and and turn Man City over, what that would do for the other nine games. Then surely they believe that the title could be theirs. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think they do believe right now. You know, they've got the momentum behind them. They're on a fantastic run of form. You know, 2024 has been remarkable, really, when you look at the numbers and you look at what Arsenal produced since the turn of the year in the Premier League. And they're never going to go to the Etihad feeling better about themselves than they do right now. And you look at this team, you sort of cast your mind back to the game at the Etihad last season when the wheels had already just started to come off Arsenal's title charge. And then they went to they went to Man City and were absolutely, you know, brutally beaten, really. It was 4-1 in the end, but it could have been a lot, lot more. You know, Aaron Ramsdale made so many good saves in that game. And it was it almost looked like men against boys. But this time around with this Arsenal team, the way they're playing at the moment, you know, they've got pretty much everyone fit. They will back themselves to go to the Etihad and turn and and put in a performance and get a get some sort of result there. Um, you know, the addition of Declan Rice to the team just makes them so much harder to beat. And defensively, there's no better team in Europe right now than Arsenal. That you know, it's not just the goals they can see or the lack of goals they're conceding, it's the lack of chances there. You know, teams are creating against them. Arsenal are incredibly difficult to play against. They're a horrible team to play against. And, you know, defensively, that partnership of Saliba and Gabriel is so, so solid. And when you put Jorginho in the form that he's been in in the big games, but especially Declan Rice ahead of those two centre-backs, then it's it's a really hard job for teams to get through Arsenal. And that's why they'll go to the Etihad and they'll fancy getting the job done. And, um, yeah, I mean, it'll be a remarkable result if they do. And like you said, I think it'll be a real, real springboard for them to go on and potentially win this title. What do you think the new contracts for Tommy Asu and, and Ben White might mean for the club? I just think it means it, it sort of continues on what we've seen, the work that they've done over the last couple of years. You know, they've Edu and the contracts team have really put an awful lot of work in into keeping this group together. You go back to previous, in the last sort of 20 years, really since the Invincibles, there's been 
the odd season, even towards the end of Wenger, when Arsenal would put a squad together that you thought, oh, this is capable. Maybe they're one or two t- players short of really being able to mount a serious charge for a title or a major honour. But then each time that squad just gets cherry picked. You know, they couldn't hold on to the players. They couldn't match their ambitions or financially they couldn't compete with other big teams that came in and just took them away. Your Fabregas's, your Nasri's, your Adebayor's, your Clichy's, all those sort of players. But this group, Arsenal have worked so hard to bring them together. But more importantly, they've kept them together. Everyone now, you, you know, White and Tommy Asu are probably the last in the line of your Sackers, Martinelli, Salibas, Gabriels, even Aaron Ramsdale before David Raya came in. All those players were handed new cont- contracts to keep them up to club, to keep the continuity going and keep this group together that Arsenal that can then build around. So they come the summer transfer window when they will do quite significant business. They're not going to have to be replacing some important players who have left because these players they know are committed and they're going to stay for the long term. So all they have to do in terms of the transfer market is continue to improve the squad. And that's something they haven't done for a long, long time. So, you know, I think they're really important deals. Ben White, especially, you know, he's a guaranteed starter in this team at the moment. Tommy Asu is a very important player as well. So, you know, I don't think they're not like these groundbreaking huge deals that are the importance of, say, Saka and maybe Martinelli or Saliba were, but it just adds to the work that has been done over the last two years to keep this group together. And do you expect quite a bit of work to be done, whether they win the title or not during the summer? Yeah, absolutely. You know, with Mikel Arteta in charge, he's not a manager who wants to see things stagnate or stand still. He knows that Arsenal have to keep improving. You know, it's it's still very much a work in progress at Arsenal. There was that sort of phrase wasn't there of trust the process with Mikel when he was sort of putting this group together. He doesn't think this process is done yet. He knows they have to continue to improve because Manchester City will. Liverpool are clearly have improved over the last year. We'll wait to see, obviously, what the new manager is, who the new manager is. But whoever it is, is going to inherit a very good young squad that Jurgen Klopp has done well to refresh in the last year or so. You know, you look at the other teams around who have been a bit of a mess over the last couple of seasons. You know, I'm very much looking at Manchester United and Chelsea when I say that. They're going to sort themselves out, you would think, are going to continue to improve. So Arsenal have to. Um, They've done some really smart business in the transfer window over the last couple of seasons. The sort of partnership that Mikel and Edu have is excellent. They're very much on on the sort of same page when it comes to building a squad and um and they're going to do that again this summer you know they'll invest pretty heavily it's a pretty open secret that they're going to be looking for a striker i wouldn't be at all surprised if a midfielder comes in potentially another wide attacker um you know aaron ramsdale is going to have to be replaced if as expected he does move on so there's a lot of work for arsenal to do and they've they're certainly not going to go into the summer expecting to stand still and would the most important signing be a, a re-signing of Mikel Arteta, as he has it only has another year left on his contract? I suppose, yeah, when you put it like that, absolutely, because he is the guy who's, who has turned things around at Arsenal. You know, he's done a remarkable job and he's he's got Arsenal back competing where they wanted to be. And, you know, a short time ago, it felt like they were a million miles away from that. And now you look at this squad, the age of it, the quality of it, and you think, you know, Arsenal were... They feel like they're going to be serial contenders now over the next few years. And that's because of the work that Mikel Arteta and Edu and the board have done together. So, yeah, it's absolutely vitally important. We've already seen links with Barcelona, which, you know, quite frankly, I don't worry about whatsoever at this stage. But um, there'll be a lot of clubs looking at Mikel Arteta because of the work he's done at Arsenal. So Arsenal will need to get him tied down to a new, new deal. It run The one he's got at the moment runs out in 2025. I fully expect a new one will be signed at the latest before the start of the next season, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if it happens fairly early on in the summer, just to bring a, bring some stability and for new signings that are potentially coming in. They know that Arteta's mm-hmm. tied down to the club for a good few years. Yeah. So yes, it's, it's essential that Mikel, uh, Mikel uh, signs a new deal and I'm absolutely confident that he will. And again, irrespective of whether they win the title or not, or how far they get in the Champions League, has this season been a success? I suppose it depends how you define success. Uh, ultimately, success when you're Arsenal is trophies, isn't it? And Arsenal haven't got a trophy yet. But, um, you know, I think if you sort of look into a crystal ball and come May, Arsenal finish second just behind Manchester City and have and have maybe got to the semi-finals of the Champions League in their first year back in it for, for seven years, I don't think you could say that's a failure. I'm not sure Arsenal would sit there celebrating. There won't be any open-top bus parades, obviously, but... It will be another year of 
building on what's been done so far. But you know, very soon you want to win trophies, don't you? That is, that's what you're judged on. Arsenal have got all their trophies dotted around the Emirates Stadium and they want to add to that. They want a new one up there and ultimately, you know, they desperately want the Premier League there. And as I said a few years ago, that felt almost impossible, but now it feels very, very real. And uh, hopefully they can get the job done this season. But if they don't and they end up finishing second, I think it's certainly been another good season. Whether you could define it as a success, successful one, I suppose everyone's going to have their own opinion on that. Well, really interesting listening to what Charles had to say and, and that relationship between Arteta and Edu, really important, Ben. Mm. But uh, how crucial and, and what is your feeling that there is clearly an understanding that Mikel Arteta ain't, ain't going anywhere, that it's a formality that he'll sign a new contract in the summer? Yeah, I think the links with Barcelona will talk to Fabrizio about it in just a moment and get his take. But they are normal in the sense that Arteta was at Barcelona's B and youth teams for a number of years, but that's not a stable project and Arsenal is. And Arteta's fully committed. He said on record that he was very upset about the Barcelona links. And nobody at Arsenal is in any kind of panic. They want to focus on the back end of this season. And then the expectation, as Charles alluded to, and I've reported many times, is that Mikel Arteta will sign a new contract and that's partly down to the faith that the club have had in him but also the fact that he feels he's not built what he wants to build yet this is not about Arsenal just winning a Premier League for the first time in 20 years or potentially a Champions League this season if they can go all the way this is about a sustained period of success this is about emulating some of his idols in the game including people like Pep that he's worked under and the best place Arteta believes he can do that is Arsenal. Moving to Barcelona, you've got politics, you've got budgetary issues. It's a massive club with a big lure, but nonetheless, it's outside of the Premier League. And I think Arteta feels like Arsenal is the right place. And it would be odd in many ways to have Arteta so hands-on in transfers and with players, including all these renewals, and then not renew himself because the key point and a big factor in a lot of these renewals, even though some of them have been relatively routine and easy, is Arteta and the investment in the playing squad in their manager. And that's why the expectation is that he'll stay at Arsenal for many years to come. OK, well, you hinted that Fab's on his way. He is on his way now, Ben. You caught up with him uh, a little bit earlier. Fabrizio, great to see you as ever. Let's start with Arsenal. Mikel Arteta has shot down suggestions that he could leave for Barcelona this summer. Is a new deal at Arsenal likely? Yeah, I think it's a really concrete possibility. Uh, from what I'm hearing, it's not something done or, or completed yet. So we have to be patient with that also because Arteta and his staff are obviously fully focused on this final two months of the season. So... It will take some time before they can enter into the, the details of this contract. But I'm sure that Arteta is super happy at Arsenal. Everything is fantastic at the club in this moment. Um, the relationship between Arteta, his staff and the players, the relationship with that dude, the relationship with the owners. So everything is going in the right direction. They believe this project is really, really important for all those who are involved uh, into the club, into the staff, Arteta himself. So I don't see any problem, any issue. It's true that we had rumors about Barcelona, but... Barca know very well that Teta is 100% committed to, to, to Arsenal project. So at the moment, I don't see any other way for Arteta rather than staying at, at Arsenal and then in the next month. And of course, it could be a busy summer for Arsenal, as we saw last summer as well. The feeling is that they may move for a striker. Who are the most likely targets, in your opinion? Yeah, I think they will take some time before deciding who is the right player, also based on the budget and based on how much they want to invest on that position. Uh, they've been in attendance many times, for example, in Portugal to follow Victor Giocares, who is doing fantastic with Sporting. Uh, they are obviously well informed on the release close situation for uh, Victor Rosiman, but in that case, the price is way higher also in terms of, of salary uh, than another player who's appreciated by multiple clubs is Benjamin Cesco. So they are keeping close eye to many strikers with different uh, profile also with different costs. This is why Arsenal will take some some time. But the idea is absolutely clear. They will go for a striker. Uh, they want to bring in an important striker for present and future of the club. And so I think it's still not time to say who is the favorite target. But there is kind of list that are players being monitored on a regular basis. And so I see Arsenal investing on that uh, on that position this summer. Perhaps depending on outgoings, we might see another Arsenal midfielder as well. We've spoken before about Aston Villa's Douglas Luiz and Real Sociedad's Martin Zubimendi. 
neither deal feels particularly easy from what you've said before. Is there any progress? Not yet, but these are players appreciated by Arsenal. So um, for sure, a player like Douglas Lewis has been in the list for a long time. Uh, I would say years, already two years ago, they wanted to sign him. So he's a player really appreciated at the club. Uh, then there is Zubimendi, who has a 60 million euros release close, but also Bayern are there. So both clubs are keeping close eye to the situation of Zubimendi. And it's not going to be an, uh, an easy one because Real Sociedad has no intention to negotiate. You have to go there and put the money on the table. Otherwise, Zubimendi is not going uh, anywhere. And then I would add also the name of Amadou Nara, who is appreciated by many clubs around Europe, who could be one of the names for the summer transfer window for Premier League clubs, and also Barcelona appreciating him. And so I think these three names are for sure being monitored by Arsenal. Also in this case, we have to understand how much Arsenal can invest, what's going to happen in terms of outgoings for the financial fair play. For example, the situation of many midfielders at the club, including Thomas Partey, who's out of contract in one year. So there are some situations to, to clarify, but for sure Arsenal are keeping close eye to midfielders too. We've had some fresh links between Arsenal and Shakhtar's Georgi Sudakov in the last 48 hours. He'll be a player in demand, no doubt, this summer. What chances of an exit? And have you got any sense yet of what kind of price Shakhtar might be looking for? I think it's going to be a super high price because uh, Napoli tried in January with a 40 million euros offer and it was turned down by Shakhtar and they didn't even want to negotiate for 45 or 50. Uh, and then he extended his contract after that with a 150 million euros that is close. So it's not going to be easy at all to sign a... Uh, Sudakov, also Juventus were interested, but they got the same kind of uh, reply in, in January. It was really complicated. Many clubs are following this boy because he's a special talent, but I think Shakhtar are not going to make it easy. And also remember that between uh, Shakhtar and Arsenal, the situation was already uh, really tough because of the Mikhailo Mudik negotiation one year and a half ago. So that was not an easy deal. Uh, we remember how Chelsea ejected that in 24 hours. Arsenal were not happy with that story. So I'm not sure they are prepared to invest that kind of big money uh, on another Shakhtar player. But let's see what's going to happen. At the moment, he's obviously one of the players being monitored by many clubs around Europe because he's a super talent. But we are not at the stage of saying, OK, that club is closer because nothing is uh, imminent at this stage from what I heard. What about Arsenal outgoings? What are you hearing on the futures of Aaron Ramsdale and Eddie Nketiah? I think we have to be patient on, on Ramsdale because obviously the goalkeeper's market is always a domino. I think the situation of David De Gea is showing us how sometimes with goalkeepers you have to be patient, you have to wait for the right opportunity. Otherwise, uh, it's not that easy. It's not like other positions where a club can say, OK, we sign you and then we see what's going to happen during the season. It's a, it's a different kind of market. And this is why the intention of Ramsdale is to play next season. So I don't see him staying at Arsenal because he will look for some opportunity around Europe to have uh, new chances and to be a starter somewhere. But also Arsenal are prepared to let him go in case they receive a good proposal. But as of today, the goalkeeper's market has not started yet. So I think it's still too early before mentioning uh, any concrete opportunity or, uh, or club. And, uh, and for Ketia, I think that could be an interesting situation in the summer. It could be similar to what happened with Balogun last summer. So uh, kind of waiting game, waiting for the right opportunity, the right proposal last summer for Balogun. At the end was Monaco, but there was interest also from Italian clubs, including Inter. So I think for Ketia, there has always been an interest from Germany. Uh, clubs in Germany always appreciated the player and, of course, from the Premier League because we know how West Ham always appreciated him. Same for Crystal Palace. So now it's still early to say if these clubs will return, but I think Ketia could be in demand this summer and obviously with Arsenal's intention to bring in a new striker, I think it's a possibility for him to, to leave us. Let's move on to Liverpool. Richard Hughes was confirmed as their new sporting director and because Michael Edwards is in, the structure appears now in place, which presumably means that they can start their search, or more aggressively anyway, for a new manager. Is Xabi Alonso still the favourite? He's their favourite candidate in terms of the most appreciated. Uh, I would say that this is the same for Bayer. So both clubs are really desperate with Xabi Alonso and they, they want to make it happen. But both clubs know very well that there is Bayer Leverkusen there with a contract with no release clause for this summer, but only starting from summer 25. So Bayer Leverkusen are in a good position. This is also complicated in terms of timing by the fact that Bayer Leverkusen are competing uh, uh, to win to win potentially the, the treble. And so it's not that easy also to enter in a concrete conversation with Xabi or with Bayer Leverkusen already in March or April. So this is why timing is also going to be a factor in this story. But Liverpool want to be there. They want to fight with Bayern. They know that Bayern will be very aggressive 
on this Xabi Alonso story because they want Xabi Alonso as priority target too. But I think already for Liverpool, it's a good news to have Michael Edwards there as a, as a FSG uh, new new CEO for this new project. And also with Richard Hughes, who is a really appreciated director, who was in the list of many clubs around Europe and is going to be in charge of, of Liverpool project next season. What about Mo Salah? A lot of talk Saudi Arabia might bid again, but other sources say he's quite happy at Liverpool and could do another season. Do you expect Salah to wait a little bit to find out who the new manager is or might he want to resolve his future one way or the other a bit earlier? I think it's always about the manager. Uh, and this is not because of Mo Salah or any other player, but when you are a superstar like these players, you always want to know, OK, now there is a director, there is a, a clear structure in place, but you always want to know who's going to be the manager, what kind of idea they have, the idea they have for present and future. So I think that's absolutely normal. He will take some time and then he will make a decision, but he's being super serious, super professional, not entertaining any conversation with any other club, despite the interest he has from Saudi since last summer. Always very, very serious and focused and committed to, to Liverpool. So I don't think this is going to be an issue. They will speak in the next months as soon as they have the manager situation clear. The interest from Saudi is still there for sure, but at the moment it's not a concrete negotiation with Mo Salah. And just a final word, Fabrizio, on Barcelona and specifically outgoings. We constantly seem to hear exit talk over some names like Frankie de Jong or Rafinha, even though the players deny they want to leave. And now there's suggestions that Ronald Arreo could depart as well. Who out of all of Barcelona's stars do you think is a likely exit as opposed to just media talk? I think it's always about the proposal, you know, but this is not just for Barcelona. I think for many clubs around Europe with financial for preludes, if you receive a crazy important proposal, then at that point you have to consider those those proposals. I think Barca have been very clear in their intention to offer a new deal to Ronald Araujo. So at that point, it's going to be about the conversation between Araujo, his agents and, and Barca to decide about the future. Frankie de Jong is still very happy at Barcelona and he's not planning to change anytime soon. So at the moment, the situation is, uh, is very quiet there. And for Rafinha, I think it always depends on the proposal. Uh, the player obviously is happy in Barcelona, but all of them are very happy in Barcelona. But at the end, it depends on the proposals. At the moment, with Rafinha, it's still quiet, but I think it could be one of the names of interest, especially in the Premier League. And in that case, we will see how Barca will react. Fabrizio, always great catching up. Keep up the good work that you do. We'll speak to you next week. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao. Ben, some interesting stuff there. I, you know, I, I get the sense that Xabi Alonso is is on his way to Liverpool, won't be going to uh, Bayern. Um, but interesting, um, you know, overall what he thinks the the ins and outs of, of of those clubs will be most most notably Arsenal. And they they were you talking about Eddie and Ketter. He he'd be a sought after striker in the league. Yeah, I think I take your point that it feels a lot of money for Enketia or any striker in that bracket, but it's also just the market, which is inflated. Mm. Um, we're going to get a range of strikers moving from Osterman at one extreme with his 100 plus million release clause all the way down to maybe some more bargain options, such as Sergio Geraci, who's got a much lower release clause. And then somewhere in between, you've kind of got the Eddie Enketias, you've got the Amanda Broyers, and generally, the clubs that may consider selling those type of players are looking for 30 plus million. And some even think that the valuation because they're high ceilings is more like 40 million. So it's going to be interesting to see with profit and sustainability, whether the market kind of comes down a little bit in its valuation. And if there's deals there to be had at lower numbers, because clubs need to sell before the financial year cutoff on the 30th of June, but it's not easy because you've got a euros for some players, you've got an Olympics as well. And I think this is going to be a very testing period in the market of ambition, but also some financial constraints and add a big tournament and an Olympics to follow afterwards. And not every single player is going to want to move early in the window as well. So I think there's two deadlines for Arsenal and for Manchester United and Chelsea. And some would argue Newcastle as well, even my team, Leicester, potentially. You got your outgoings one. Can you get in that 70 to 100 million? And then can you breathe a bit easier? And then how much of that 70 to 100 million can you put onto your budget? And that's the second part of the window that takes us up to the deadline. The way your team's going, Ben, you're going to be playing championship football <laughs> next year again. Let's just not talk about it. I think there's a game, isn't there, <laughs> against Bristol City coming up that could ruin yeah, our season? That's fine. No, <laughs> we'll give you three points there. Don't you worry about that. Um, we're, we're not beating anyone. Uh, just, Ben, um, where do Arsenal finish this season? I think they 
don't win the Premier League, which is not the best thing to say when we've got an Arsenal audience. I think they'll miss out. I don't think they'll miss out by much. But as I've already said, I don't think that they'll go and beat Manchester City. If they do, I'll change my mind because I think that game is so pivotal. But what I would say is if they don't win the Premier League, for me, it's not a disaster if they close the gap in a thrilling season. It's not the same as last season where they have a lead and they blow a lead. This season, they're not the favourites, even though they're top on goal difference. So if they go on and win the Premier League, amazing. If they finish second by three points or less and take it down to the final day, I actually think that's progress. And the other thing I would say to soften the blow, because otherwise all these Arsenal fans will be on following me, is if they don't win the Premier League, I fancy them to not buy and out the Champions League, which means that they're suddenly not far off making a push to win the Champions League. And I could foresee a situation where, even though they may have to beat Manchester City in the league and in the Champions League, I can foresee a situation where in a cup competition, this Arsenal side go all the way in the Champions League. But I don't think they'll quite have enough to win the Premier League. No, however successful they are, I think just Man City might be that little bit more successful based on, on the run-in, as we have already discussed, uh, both with Charles and yourself. Uh, ben, thank you very much indeed for joining me. Thank you, everybody, for listening. My thanks to Fabrizio Romano, as ever, to Charles Watts uh, for his contribution. And we hope to have more of that as the season reaches its finale. Thanks, everyone, for listening. We are, of course, back again next week with more informed comment here on The Debrief.